Hello, everyone, and welcome to NACTO's public webinar series and today's event discussing curbside management. Uh, my name is Craig Tuchek. I'm program analyst and designer at NACTO, and I'll be moderating this webinar. I'd also like to welcome our panelists. We have Danielle Harris from SFMTA, and from DDOT, Benito Perez, Evian uh, Patterson, and Faye Daskib, as well as Patrick Powell from the Golden Triangle Business Improvement District in DC. Um, and they'll all be discussing curbside management projects they've been carrying out in San Francisco and Washington, D.C. Uh, for those of you who are new to NACDO, we're the National Association of City Transportation Officials. We're a coalition of 61 city transportation departments and transit agencies across North America. And our goal is to build cities as places for, uh, for people with safe, sustainable, accessible, and equitable transportation choices that support a strong economy and a vibrant quality of life. We do this largely through knowledge transfer, bringing together city transportation departments to learn from each other, helping cities develop city-focused design standards that meet urban needs and conditions, and through events like this webinar, providing a platform for leading and new voices in transportation. Uh, we host webinars like this on an ongoing basis, so please check out our website, nacto.org events to see what's up next. Uh, first, some quick announcements and logistics to start us off. Um, First, an announcement that the deadline for Leadership NACTO, our new program to train the next generation of leaders at city transportation departments, is December 31st. So check out leader, uh, nacto.org slash leadership for more info. Uh, second, I wanted to remind everyone about a curbside management project we're working on with ITE. You may have received a link to a survey we're conducting to see what you're doing in your cities in terms of curbside management. If you work for a city and haven't completed it yet, uh, you'll find a link to the survey on the page for this event on our website under nacto.org slash events. On that, the event page, you'll also find a link to information about a related session that we'll be co-hosting with ITE at TRB. Uh, we'll be releasing a recording of this webinar in the slides on our website in the next few days, so keep an eye out for that. And finally, we're planning to leave about 20 minutes for questions at the end. Uh, you'll see a question box on your on-screen control panel. Uh, please type your questions as you think of them, and we'll try to get through as many as possible at the end. Uh, so before we dive into the work that our panelists have been doing in DC and SF, I wanted to briefly discuss our new white paper, Curb Appeal, which focuses on managing curbs to improve transit reliability specifically. With an increasing demand for a limited supply of curbside space, Many cities are finding their busiest streets are being impeded by double parked vehicles, um, for hire vehicles, delivery trucks, and other street users. In dense, high demand areas like these, keeping transit flowing is critical to the success of a, of a corridor and even a whole city. Other users, passenger drop offs and pickups and deliveries are critical as well. So the paper outlines some ways that we can make the best of the curbside space that we have, dedicating room for these users largely by managing on-street parking, dedicating space to the most critical street uses, and using curbside space to give priority uh, to transit on the street. So I'll step, uh, walk us through really quickly the main four points of this paper, and you can access it, the entire paper at nacto.org slash curb appeal. Um, the first one is to rethink how we look at curbside space in general. Um, a lot of cities have been looking at uh, curbside space is a parking lane, the property almost of adjacent businesses or residences, um, only to be used for parking, really. But space is needed for a lot of different users, from deliveries uh, to construction workers, to taxi and for hire vehicle drop-offs and food trucks. We need to change how we think about curbsides, think of them as flex zones, which can be um, dedicated to meet a corridor's or neighborhood-specific demands and priorities rather than just a parking lane. In Seattle, um, the city's uh, recent transportation plan has um, ranked different priorities based on surrounding land uses um, with a little bit of flexibility built in. For, uh, for example, the first priority here is the modal plan priority. So um, their citywide transit or bike plans, for example, might take precedence in some areas over uh, these other more distinct uh, uses. The second key point is to measure what's happening on your streets so that you can dedicate to the most productive and useful curbside users. Parking might not turn over very well, um, or very often if you allow cheaper free parking without a time limit, and it might take up valuable space that um, is needed for other users. And 
cause delivery trucks and other vehicles to double park uh, to do what they need to do. Um, I think we've skipped ahead of the slide here. Hmm. Well, in any case, um, getting your streets organized and dedicating space to users that need it uh, is critical to making sure that everybody can flow um, easily and cleanly. So this is a sort of before after a snapshot of what a street might look like um, without any dedicated space to transit or uh, delivery or parking into something that's more organized with clear and dedicated space to different users, um, hopefully keeping all the conflicting users out of each other's ways. This is an example uh, from Rainier Avenue in Seattle, formerly just a um, four lane street, two lanes in each direction um, with some parking on some segments and a pretty frequent bus line, um, but not really any designated space for turns or um, the transit priority features. So in the reconfiguration of the street that was changed to install some turn lanes, which helped keep um, cars that were waiting to turn, perhaps waiting for pedestrians to cross uh, out of the way of through moving buffers. Um, the result from that was um, faster transit times and not much impact on um, vehicular traffic in addition to safety uh, benefits. The fourth um, key principle from the paper is to move loading and access nearby. Um, so sometimes curb space on a street is needed for higher priority uses like a bus or a bike lane, but businesses still need to get um, access for deliveries and passenger drop-offs. On the busiest corridors with really high demand, making the most of your curb means prioritizing who can use the space and for how long. Dedicating space um, where loading is a high priority use to these loading uses so that they don't have to park um, in a travel lane or in a bike lane. Some loading or access users can move around the block or down, um, down the street. Uh, where parking is loading uh, is located, setting occup occupancy targets and pricing accordingly can help keep a few free spaces available per block for loading activities. Parking on a busy corridor should typically be short term, but spaces around the corner or down the block could work for longer periods. Um, so New York City had a, a study a few years ago in Nostrand Avenue when they were installing a select bus service line, uh, asking the merchants along that corridor how they get the, their deliveries and what they would prefer for the, their deliveries. Um, the finding helped figure out what time of day and for how long delivery trucks were parking and determined um, if it would be feasible to relocate a loading zone around the corner or down the block, somewhere out of the way of the bus. So um, asking your merchants, measuring your streets uh, to figure out how they're being used and where they can be flexible uh, can help prioritize uh, key users like buses, which move thousands of people um, that don't want to be blocked by one truck in the bus lane. Finally, the last key idea is to look beyond the corridor and consider whole neighborhoods comprehensively, uh, thinking about parking, not only including on-street parking on the main street, uh, but looking within a block or two, a reasonable walk, as well as off-street uh, options. So this is just an example of a study from San Francisco on Polk Street looking at parking occupancy. Polk Street's in the middle. Um, that's where everybody wants to be parking because that's where the businesses are, but there's a lot of space still left um, on adjacent streets. And some of the study that was done here, um, I believe found that a lot of people end up walking anyway. So uh, the number of folks that drive and park specifically on Polk Street aren't really that high. Um, and some of that space could be dedicated to other users of higher priority. So that's just a quick overview of that. Um, you'll hear more of some specific projects um, that have been done in San Francisco and DC here in a minute. Uh, you can, again, find the paper at nacto.org slash curb appeal. And with that, I'd like to pass it off to Danielle Harris, um, who will talk about their work in managing curbsides in San Francisco. Hi, everyone. This is Danielle Harris. Um, I'm a senior planner in the Office of Innovation here at the SFMTA. Uh, I want to thank NACTO and DDOT for the opportunity for San Francisco to participate in today's webinar about a very pressing and exciting topic, curb management. 
Um, I also want to start by acknowledging the unexpected passing of Mayor Ed Lee. Uh, the city family is deeply saddened by this loss and our, thought, our thoughts and hearts are with his family. Um, many of you may know that the pilot that San Francisco has started um, was really championed by the mayor's office, um, really urging San, uh, SFMTA and private partners to work together to uh, resolve curb management issues in a more innovative approach. So I just wanted to make that note before we start. Uh, so for today, I'm going to just do a brief overview of um, just where emerging mobility is fitting in this space. And when I talk about emerging mobility, I'm talking about Uber, Lyft, uh, Chariot, and a number of other um, types of emerging mobility like bike share. Um, I just really want to broaden the scope a little bit more for us here. Okay. So um, at the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency, we do uh, a little bit of everything. So we do bicycles, we talk about, we do transit, we do taxis, um, all street design, parking and traffic, um, as well as dealing with emerging mobility. So I just wanted to start uh, and share some of our travel mode share for this year. Um, San Francisco is pretty diverse in our mode split. Uh, it's about a quarter transit and a little bit more than a quarter of driving alone uh, and a quarter of walking. And then you can see that TNCs are kind of picking up and actually going a little beyond what bi biking is. Uh, but I also want to note that it really depends on where you are in the city. So the map here in the lower left shows you the mode split by residential location. And the orange represents the TNCs, which you can see are more heavily located in the northeast quadrant of the city. While if you go more towards the, the avenues in the south side of the city, there's a little less use of TNCs. Uh, but you can see there's a high proportion of driving, which is the uh, kind of purple blue there. So there's, it's really has to, it's strongly tied to land use, and I just really want to note that when we're talking about this. So uh, this is a slide that comes from the San Francisco Smart Cities Challenge proposal, and these were the five issues that we focused on. Uh, we really wanted to focus on how mobility is such a large slice of people's income. Uh, also, part of Vision Zero, you know, we have we're really focusing on getting to zero. We have a somewhat fragmented transit network uh, that doesn't meet all of our users' needs. I know everyone is very familiar with our affordability crisis, including, including our housing crisis, um, as well as there's still, you know, 43% of greenhouse gases are caused by transportation. So this is the focus of, of uh, our mission here at the SFMTA. So uh, this is the number one culprit for those issues that we like to say. And so San Francisco does a little bit better in terms of the whole region, but 48% is still a very high proportion. So why do we accept emerging mobility? And it's really the fact that it has the potential to move more people with less vehicles, and therefore it potentially reduces auto ownership and dependency. And that's what the Office of Innovation is really exploring those opportunities. So today we're kind of seeing a shift in transportation trends right now. So traditionally it used to be you own your own car, um, you drive your own car, and here in San Francisco you also take Muni and ride your bike. Um, and we imagine the future being more or less uh, people using more emerging mobility options uh, to meet their needs and less dependency on vehicles. But right now we're kind of in this awkward middle space. So there's Everybody wants to keep their car, but they also want the flexibility of using all of these emerging mobility services to their own use. Uh, and what those emerging mobility services are is like, right, we have little um, scooter share, we have micro transit, we have car share, um, we have bike share, and a number of other carpooling services. So what does this mean for the curve? This means that people kind of want their cake and they want to eat it too, right? They want free on-street car storage, aka parking, but they also want the flexibility to use these services. So it's causing this congestion at the curb. And what, is, what does that mean? So we have a number of curb management issues associated with that, and it's really tied to the congestion. So here in San Francisco, the fire department and the police department are really stressing the fact that they're ha struggling to meet their emergency response times. And then um, here on the top right is a photo of Valencia Street, which recently had a 
an event where people had a parking, um, a human protected bike lane. So that's in response to the fact that the bike lane is frequently being used for loading and causing some hazards for cyclists using the street. And then in the lower left, we have a, a picture of one of our transit vehicles being stopped due to people loading in the travel lane as well. And then the middle photo is a, a response to our commuter shuttle programs. And that is really just speaking to the fact that we need to bring community along and then we're having this conversation um, and really having them understand why we're doing what we're doing and, and really promoting the benefits and also responding to their concerns as well. And then the lower right, we're all very familiar with congestion and what that means and more or less just focusing on greenhouse gases, unneeded stress on our streets, and the potential for just more friction and modal conflicts. So how is SFMTA approaching passenger loading? So we have a color curb program, which is um, based on requests. And those requests usually come from hospitals or hotels um, or large venues that are requesting a color curb, typically for loading either a yellow curb or a white curb. And then we also receive 311 complaints that regularly evolve into a log, which is a project that someone works, a, a small scale project that somebody works on. We also have a number of different types of improvement projects. It could just be a road diet, which is a street improvement, or it could be a transit improvement, which um, we have a number of bus rapid transit projects moving forward. Um, we also have some station transit station improvements. The Transbay is opening next year. Um, and then in terms of land use, we have a number of developments happening here in downtown San Francisco and area plans. So I just wanted to note and see how um, the span of passenger loading and how it's almost in every single division here in S at the SFMTA. So why are we focusing on TNC so much? And the, for San Francisco, TNCs represent a very large share of the passenger loading that's happening. Uh, here are some photos. Um, these are screenshots from the TNCs Today report that was um, released in June um, by our friends at the SFCTA. And it's really rich data about TNC activity here in San Francisco. You can see the top right corner of the city is really dense, it's really dark. So there's a lot of TNCs in that area, while more in the outer regions of the city, it's, it's a lot lighter. And then you could see that the, the level of detail goes into time of day on a specific day and what, that, what the loads, the pickup and the drop off is. So um, this is really represents the only data that we have in terms of passenger loading demand. And that's why we're so focused on TNCs. But I really wanna note that there's other emerging mobility services that are needing passenger loading space, such as ride sharing, which is similar to carpooling um, apps, microtransit, courier network services like Postmates, Grubhub, um, and others. And then we all know that autonomous vehicles are coming. And then we also have existing um, transportation services that have passenger loading needs. And we have goods deliveries that are happening here in San Francisco and actually in increasingly with e-commerce. So where do we need passenger loading most? Is pretty much where, there's, where people are, are going. So large commercial corridors, transit stations, uh, business centers, and that's the reason why most of our northeast quadrant of the city is so dark and dense with at TNCs, uh, but there's also a lot of tourist attractions that are attracting um, TNCs as well, and hospitals and schools as well. And uh, to kind of co-sign on that, the 2017 Lifty Awards were released, and more or less, um, you know, the AT&T Park is a major event space, and then SF MoMA and Mission Dolores Park are also um, tourist destinations, and then you have UCSF, which is kind of a medical center here in San Francisco. So when do we need passenger loading most is a really important part to note. And I wanna show how um, basically it grows over the week. So, you know, Monday you're really on top of your game and come, come the end of the week, maybe you're not ready to wake up on time and you hit the snooze a little bit more and then you're not gonna make your bus, right? So that's kind of why you're like, oh, maybe I'll take a TNC. And that is why you kind of see that it's growing as the week goes on. But TNCs have created a new nighttime peak that's after the AM peak and after the PM peak of the commute. And it happens primarily from 6 p.m. to 1 a.m. and that's on Thursdays and Saturday nights. 
So what do we know about TNC operations? So first, I really want to highlight that Uber and Lyft are digital platforms to connect drivers and riders. Drivers are private contractors, so Uber and Lyft are not really regulating them in a sense. They're more or less, they're serving as a broker between drivers and riders, and that's really important to note. And uh, we've been doing some analysis on dwell time. Pickup is, is kind of is a challenge, and it can range from one to five minutes on average, but there are instances when it definitely goes beyond that. The drop-off, on the other hand, is really quick, and it could be 30 seconds or less, uh, depending on how many people are in the vehicle and how much luggage people have. So what do the drivers and riders of TNCs know? And that's really important because that highlights some of the challenges involved. So when a rider makes a hail, they know the make, model, and license plate of the car. Uh, they also know the name and that have a photo as well as an ETA for the driver. And they also have the score as out of the five-star score. And then they have the price and the ETA of their trip. And if they also have information about other riders if they're pooling. And for the drivers, they know the same things about the riders, except for the fact that they don't know the destination um, or the route that, that the rider is going to be taking until they pick them up. So there's a lot of unknowns there until they make contact with each other. And that's really important to note because that's kind of um, why there's a lot of challenges in, in, the, in the connection between riders and drivers. So TNC's tool, so um, working with the companies, they've shared a number of tools that they have. So they have something called suggested pickups, which is really encouraging riders to walk to a more convenient location for the driver to pick them up. And they really incentivize them to, to say that, you know, your driver is going to be able to arrive sooner if you, do, if you walk a few blocks maybe. Uh, another tool, a really helpful tool, is geofencing, and there's three types of geofences. So there's a geofence where you kind of aggregate all the pickup and drop off where you want them. So you can look in the uh, heat maps here, and more or less you can see that they're in the top left, top right corner, there's a, uh, a lot of activity that's the orangey red kind of there. And then in the after photo, there's a purple pin, and you can see that the that those pickup and drop offs kind of relocated to where that pin is. And that's what the venue feature is really helpful for. Uh, there's also blackout zones, which prohibit pickup and drop offs. And that's what uh, the companies have been really helpful um, with Market Street. You know, this is primarily a, a transit street for us. And then there's also identifiers. So uh, many of you that use TNCs to F at airports, it's really helpful to make help drivers and riders make contact because they can identify doors by numbers so that drivers know to go to door four if because the rider is at door four. So for us here in San Francisco, geofencing has been really successful for a number of different ways just to identify pickup and drop-off zones, but also to you know prevent problematic pickup and drop-offs like Market Street, which I just mentioned, um, and to call, consolidate pickup and drop-offs. And, and this really just serves to reduce congestion and impacts to neighborhoods as well as improving the rider-driver experience. Um, and it re really reduces the need for enforcement and therefore citation. So it's kind of a win-win for both sides. So what we don't know. So we don't know how many cars there are. Um, so we do have no idea how many pickups and drop-offs are actually happening. Um, and we don't have an idea of when they're happening and then what the rate in which they're happening. And then we also don't know where are the primary destinations and origin of that trip. Um, as well as the directionality of the trip. And, and that just really serves to say, you know, if someone is trying to get dropped off on the north side of the street, but they're coming um, on the south side of the street, then, you know, the pickup and drop off doesn't really match. And, and sometimes that causes unsafe um, vehicle movements. Uh, we also don't know the proportion of unsafe versus safe passenger loading. So how much of that loading is happening at the curb? How much of that loading is happening in congested spaces, um, in a bike lane, or on a transit route? And we also have, we don't know about the trip purpose, and we have very little information about the user demographic. So who is using these services? So this all creates a lot of challenges when we're, when we're thinking about TNCs. So new drivers, so one, there's new drivers joining the platform every day, every week, 
and more or less getting acclimated to the service. But also here in San Francisco, we have a very complex network with a lot of different um, traffic controls uh, that are really difficult to navigate if you're new. And uh, TNCs today released by the SFCTA notes that a lot of our drivers are not from San Francisco and they may not be as familiar with the roads, the streets here. Also, the customer is always right. Um, and the reason I say that is because of the five-star system. So here in San Francisco, we have so many drivers that um, we receive a higher quality of TNC trips. So more or less, if you go below, below four stars, you're removed from the platform. So basically, you're fired. So this is gives the customer a lot of control um, and about how that ride goes. And sometimes that means making unsafe driving maneuvers, such as mid-block U-turns and sudden, sudden lane changes um, to get that door-to-door -door service that most customers are really seeking. Uh, I also want to note that the accuracy of the pin is very difficult if there's a lot of tall buildings. Um, and here in San Francisco, you know, we're a very dense city and we have a lot of tall buildings. So sometimes, you know, the pin will say that the driver is, the rider is here and the driver gets there and really the rider may be a few feet down um, and which creates, creates a lot of chaos sometimes. Um, also, going back to that factor that, you know, TNCs, our serve as a platform, the accountability of drivers is just really not there. They're private contractors. They're responsible to follow the roads, this, the traffic laws. Um, and sometimes that becomes very difficult to enforce, um, as well as the fact that there's so many different types of curbs and controls that we have that sometimes education would be really beneficial to not only drivers, but to riders as well, as where these pickups and drop-offs should be happening. So what are we doing about it? So here in San Francisco, we're doing a lot about it. Um, we have a number of different efforts going on uh, with the city attorney um, requesting data from these companies. Um, it's also giving insights to, you know, the public is really seeing this as um, they're starting to vocalize the concerns about this more and more. Um, you know, the SFPD has also noticed there's a lot of violations going on. So uh, this brings us to our pilot. So in May, the, the mayor presented a proposal that we work with the companies, that the SFMPA work with the companies to make pick up and drop off happen in a safer manner. So the who, what, when, why, why of this effort is here. So it's the mayor's office, it's the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency, as well as the private partners. So that's TNCs, microtransit, as well as autonomous vehicle companies. And really the effort is to focus on stopping illegal, um, illegal stop, stop, illegal stopping <laughs> in the travel lane, transit only lane, bike lane, bus stop, and crosswalk. It sounds like they're everywhere, um, but more or less, we just really want a safer setup in, in our streets um, and really want to ensure that transit performance is not delayed and really just ease localized congestion. So where is this happening? We really want to find a place to host the pilot that's a neighborhood commercial corridor that would benefit most because this is these are spaces where there's a lot of activity in TNCs. So when are we do this? When are we doing this? That's unknown at this time. Um, and we don't have a specific location yet. So our pilot is not as evolved as DC's. Uh, so what are the resources that we have available? So as I mentioned, TNCs today is a really helpful report and we're so lucky to have our partners at the SFCTA. Um, we also are doing merchant loading surveys to just understanding, you know, what is the specific um, goods movements that are happening on those commercial corridors. We're also establishing new kind of field work observations, you know, to figure out the dwell time. What is the capacity of a curb? How many cars can it take? Um, and just going back to our traditional traffic counts as well. We've also taken footage throughout the city of um, major corridors where there's a lot of TNC activity to get an understanding of their behavior. And then uh, we have 311 complaints that come from our public that kind of give us data points on where there's trouble spots. So uh, how is this going to work? More or less, we're going to put our two skill sets together. Um, so the city, as you know, we do planning and engineering. We have physical infrastructure, so that's primarily curb space and signage. Um, we also are going to, you know, we already released a number of projects with our community and having those conversations. Uh, so that's really our specialty. And then we have the jurisdiction to enforce. And then our private partners have um, really, really, rich data about their operations, 
Um, they have their digital infrastructure, so that's once again the geofencing as well as the suggested pickups. And then they have a lot easier, a number of different ways that they can make contact with their drivers and riders through the app as well as through um, text and email. And also they have business connections as well. So more or less there's Uber Eats and other different types of private uh, partnerships that they've done on their own uh, that we're hoping to leverage. So when starting the pilot, we're doing existing conditions so really, you know, understanding what is the landscape. Um, so here we did a pretty extensive curb inventory, um, just more or less to get the lay of the land. So not only what are the colors of the curbs, but what are the meters, um, as well as what is the uh, regulations at that time. And so what are the transit routes, bike routes, collisions, and volumes, and then specific to TNCs, what are the dwell times? Um, so really taking a thorough analysis of the space. And then this is really the meat of the pilot is, is really trying to figure out what is the approach that we want to take. Do we want to release one zone at a time or do we want to do multiple zones um, or do we want to have, and then also like when do we want to enforce these zones? Is it all day? Is it only at the peak time um, going, back, going back to that nighttime peak? Um, or do we want to vary it based on demand throughout the day? Um, also, do we want to do incremental fixes or just like one big change and see and observe that one big change or do we want to do a bunch of mini, uh, many, mini pilots? Uh, and then as well as what is the design? What does this look like? Um, and it's just going back to our traditional white curve with some signs uh, to let riders and drivers know where these locations are. Or are we going to introduce a new type of curb um, and a new type of sign? Or is it something completely different and we really need to be thinking outside the box? So we want to explore all options in our pilot. So um, really, this the most important part is having a conversation with the community. Um, you know, we understand that, you know, parking on the street is really important to a lot of people's livelihoods and their ability to get to and from work, um, not knowing that not all places are transit accessible or biking accessible or walking. Um, so we really want to, wherever we decide to host the pilot, we want to understand what are the unique neighborhood transportation issues of that neighborhood. Uh, we want to share the, you know, the goals of the pilot and then ideally find a community that is, is wanting to host this pilot and work on that. So we're hoping to incorporate those communities' goals into the pilot as well. And then throughout the duration of the pilot, we want to you know, give updates, progress reports, um, and re definitely receive their feedback because that's their, you know, they're the boots on the ground more or less. And they're going to give us some really rich data about what's happening. So, and then, of course, we'll be doing a final evaluation on our pilot. Um, and really, we've just been focusing on taking a really scientific approach here and um, really seeing, you know, measure, doing metrics to measure the success of the pilot. Um, and we have a number of very focused categories that we're doing that with. So, what, you know, street safety, what are the economic impacts of these zones? Are they creating more congestion? Or are they successfully easing congestion? Um, as well as compliance, is, is, are they working? Are people really pulling over to the curb? And then our private partners are really interested in, you know, how, does, how do these zones impact the rider and driver experience? Um, so after we establish these metrics, we really want to determine baseline data and do a rich collection of data before we start the pilot. Um, and then do frequent evaluations. And once we figure out things within the first quarter or so, um, how can we change the pilot a little bit and iterate and do it all over again? So with that, I'm um, sorry I went a little bit over. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And I just want to thank NACTO and uh, DC again. And I'm going to hand it over to DC. Uh, hello, everybody. Hopefully you can hear us. Uh, my name is Daniel Perez, Curbside Management Planner with the District Department of Transportation here in Washington, D.C. Uh, on behalf of my colleague, uh, Evian Patterson, he sends his regrets not being here. Um, it's snowing here in Washington, so we're also trying to do double duty and snow response. Uh, but the rest of us here, uh, I'm joined by Ms. Faye Dasky and Mr. Patrick Powell. Uh, we're going to talk about our pilot. We're going to try to uh, get us back up to uh, schedule as best as we can, so bear with us. Um, 
So for those of you who don't know, we're in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. Please come visit us. Uh, population closing in on 700,000, uh, sixth largest metro. So we got a lot of people coming and going into and out of the city. How they're doing it? Multiple ways of transportation. Uh, public transportation is one of our biggest ones. We're competing with New York, second behind them on public transit uh, mode share. Uh, and we also have a growing population of the district who don't own a car, so they're relying on other modes of transportation, biking, walking, transit, and of course our burgeoning um, uh, four higher vehicles, uh, including our traditional taxis and also the, the transportation network companies. Uh, the district, uh, compared to other, a lot of other cities, uh, we're pretty much an arterial system, so we're relying on our, our streets and roadways to move all these modes of transportation um, throughout the district. Uh, so we cannot be a city to focus on just the car. Uh, you, know, you may think of uh, us having a war on cars. We, we want to convey that that's not what we're trying to do. Uh, we want to, if anything, we declared war on the idea that the car, the car and parking is the only option of travel. Uh, so we're trying to find many different ways to repurpose the curbside uh, to facilitate all these other modes of transportation, whether, you know, for our motor coaches, because we're the one of the, we are the largest destination for our motor coaches, uh, our trucks to facilitate our uh, commercial freight, uh, expanding our sidewalks, and also what brings us to this conversation is uh, repurposing the curbside to facilitate uh, transportation network companies. Uh, with that, uh, and this was a slide from our presentation out in Chicago for those that did attend the NACTA Designing Cities Conference. Uh, great conference, by the way, if you uh, like to attend next year. Uh, anyway, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues, uh, Faye and uh, Patrick, and I'm going to turn it over first to Patrick. All right. Thank you, Benito. So this is our study area. This is the Golden Triangle Business Improvement District. Um, you can kind of see the mall and the White House to the south, and to the north there is DuPont Circle. It's about 43 blocks, and the part we're focusing on are the northern three blocks along Connecticut Avenue Northwest. We have about 90,000 daytime workers in our in our business improvement district uh, during the day, um, and it definitely uh, changed drastically at night. The, our study area that we're looking at here within us several blocks has 100 different nightlife and uh, restaurant uh, uses with an occupancy well over 17,500. Um, we've had curb si or, uh, sidewalk pedestrian counts over a thousand people an hour in certain parts of the area of that uh, of that study area. You can see this is a video of Connecticut Avenue as it cycled through uh, through a month, and you can see the different uh, uses and the different angled streets that come into that area. One of our primary concerns uh, with this uh, pilot was to address some safety issues that we saw uh, at night. You can young lady catching her, looking for her uh, TNC ride uh, in the center lane of traffic, uh, which caused a little bit of a traffic congestion issue. Um, we also uh, wanted to look at what the impact on buses and emergency vehicles that this, this kind of not curbside loading is, uh, is having. So beginning uh, in 2016, uh, we started working with the nightclub owners, the Golden Triangle that is, started working with the nightclub owners. Uh, and then in November 2016, we assembled a group uh, ranging from the chief of police to other uh, leaders within uh, DDOT, um, Department of Consumer Regulatory Affairs, the ABC board, many of the other agencies that have a role in management of nightlife. Um, we used what uh, is referred to as the RHI model. It's the Responsible Hospitality Institute. Uh, we really see our nightlife in our neighborhood as a resource, but it's also a resource that has externalities that need to be managed. All right, so um, DDOT was one of the participants in the working group, and um, the first thing we tried to do was to identify issues that need to be addressed in the working group. Uh, we wanted to address safety issues, um, definitely our focus was to implement some of our Vision Zero's, um, some of the components of our Vision Zero plan. So uh, once we started in identifying the issue, we realized that one of the issues was the TNCs parked in travel lanes to pick up and drop off passengers and therefore um, creating congestion, blocking emergency and transit vehicles, and um, increasing pedestrian vehicular um, 
conflicts in the area. So um, why did TNCs park in travel lanes? The reason was the nearest non-travel lane, which was a parking lane, was fully occupied by parked vehicles. And the reason for that was that we have, after 10 p.m. on that stretch of Connecticut Avenue, we had no restricted um, parking. So um, vehicles could park after 10 p.m. Um, up to, until the next morning. So what we did was the first step that we took was we set up time-lapse cameras to um, at the site to sort of find out what, go, what, what goes on the site during nightlife hours. We also, the Golden Triangle bid reached out to TNCs, um, in this case Uber and Lyft, to uh, um, sort of have them confirm, confirm based on their data whether these blocks are the highest, have the highest pickup drop-offs during the nightlife hours, which was after 10 p.m. Uh, we also did a curbside audit to see uh, what the restrictions are on street and the signage, and whenever possible, we try to combine our rush hour signs and nightlife restriction signs. So once we did all that, uh, we also looked at um, the legislative authority, uh, whether we could do this or not. And we found out that, of course, because we're not a state, we were able to do that. Um, we were we were functioning as a state, but we didn't have um, any restrictions on our roadways as far as um, um, restricting parking. So we could do that. So um, that box was checked off. And then once the did all that homework, we went back to the working group and um, presented them our recommendation. So um, I just wanted to uh, note that um, one of the items, one of the things we looked at was geofencing. However, soon enough, we found out that um, in our case, geofencing um, um, was not the best option. We tried it in other areas in the city and didn't necessarily um, work for us. So. Um, our recommendation to the working group was to basically remove parking on that stretch of Connecticut Avenue from 10 p.m. until the next morning at 7 a.m. and um, sort of make it available for pickup drop-off for TNCs, for personal vehicles, and taxis. So uh, we also looked at positive and negative impacts. In our case, we got lucky because we didn't have a lot of RPP, residential parking permit spaces, Nearby, so we didn't have we didn't have to deal with a lot of spillover in residential areas. So if you um, if you're a city that um, wants to implement a similar program, but you have residential spaces um, nearby, you need to look into that just to see how to deal with the spillover impact. Um, so this slide shows shows our study area. We basically removed 60 parking spaces after 10 p.m in five block faces, um, north of M Street, between M Street and DuPont Circle. Um, next slide. Um, so as I said, we did a curbside audit, and which in designing our signage, we tried to combine our rush hour signage and our nightlife um, restrictions. And in here, you can see the final sign that we came up with in areas that we had rush hour signage. On the top, you see the rush hour restrictions, and in the middle of the sign, you see the nightlife restrictions. And this is, these are the signs uh, when we install the signs. This is a picture of the signs that we have on site right now. So um, prior to the launch, we did an extensive amount of outreach to businesses. Um, the bid reached out to businesses. We sent uh, notices to DSHV, which is the Department of for Hire Vehicles that oversees our uh, TNCs and taxi cabs in the district. And we also send out press releases to residents, um, two or three press releases we sent out um, a month coming up to the launch of the program. And uh, we launched our program in October. We got a lot of good press release, um, discussed with a lot of cities that are interested, who are interested in implementing similar programs. And Patrick now will discuss some of the reactions that the BIT got from the enforcement officers as well as the businesses. So we've gotten a lot of positive input from the businesses and some of the commercial building owners in that area. Um, we haven't, I haven't had one complaint from the, the owners, which was kind of a concern for us because we thought maybe this is uh, mostly uh, uh, employee parking. Um, my conversations with the TNCs uh, have, you know, they've unofficially told me that they've had an increase in cu customer uh, uptake. Uh, they did tell me that this area is someone is an area where they see the the longest uh, wait times for service. 
So we're 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 going to be looking at that as the as the pilot uh, progresses. Um, and the the police department has told me the club action team has told me that um, that they've seen a, a decrease in the kind of pedestrian conflict. Um, the one kind of challenge we're having is that on one of the blocks it's really really working well because that happens to be where the club action team typically stages earlier in the evening. So they're taking a very active role in managing that and preventing vehicles from uh, from parking in that area. So the next step is really getting a firm handle on the other couple blocks and and ensuring that vehicles aren't parking there and blocking the uh, the pickup and drop off zone. All right. So to wrap this up here for DC, uh, you know what's next for us? Um, so as we alluded to earlier, I mean we we looked at just the general conversation with TNC management, you know, the idea of geofencing, and we've realized uh, we've tried it for the inauguration, we've tried it for um, our stadium event area, and we've come to realize after back and forth and seeing how it operates from our perspective, uh, instead of trying to stipulate to the operators, like, you can't do this, can't do that, you can't operate here or there, is to collaborate with them and figure out what is the end goal, what's the behavior modification that we want to do. Uh, so that's what we've been doing a lot, and, and the case here for this pi uh, pilot was we don't want passengers being picked up and dropped off in the middle of the street. So what can the district do to help, and what can you do as the operator to uh, to facilitate this? Uh, and we'll continue to uh, first of all we'll continue to evaluate the project. Uh, we'll look at it six months from now. So early in the spring we'll probably have more firm uh, uh, statistics and analysis done on it, uh, and then. I'll, of course, at the one year at the birthday party as well. Um, and then we'll also at the same time uh, establish a collaborative working group, uh, same group that the Golden Triangle bid reached out to, but also include our TNC operators. And again, talk about um, is there met, uh, criteria, guidelines on where do we identify additional locations or if we expand the zone, how should it operate? Uh, much uh, similar to what San Francisco was discussing earlier, you know, is it a one place at a time, multiple areas at a time, you know, incremental changes or, you know, a big change? So we'll be having those conversations going into 2018. Uh, and with that, for the sake of time, we are done here in the district. So, again, come visit us in the spring for the cherry blossoms. Thanks, everyone. That was great. Um, so now we can move into a few questions that we've gotten um, I'll kick off with one for DC about metrics. Uh, what kind of metrics are you using uh, to, um, to determine the efficacy of the loading zones and um, how do you determine how you go forward after this? So I uh, made a note on my last slide, some metrics that we are considering evaluating, but again, we have, we're still in that stage where um, we wanted to take action immediately. Um, so right now we're trying to figure out how, what's the best way to do some evaluation. So we had some ideas, as I noted in the last slide, but happy to take additional feedback from uh, other stakeholders and those listening in. Um, we've had some collaboration also with San Francisco um, as well. So um, definitely want to look at our, you know, how our transit is uh, operating. Is there the efficiency improvements there? Uh, if there's safety improvements, also hearing from our TNC operators, their you know dwell time and uptake. Um, same thing here. Maybe there's uh, quantitative metrics that uh, our Metropolitan Police Department can provide. You know, reduction in um, crime incidences or whatever the case may be. Um, so we'll have to look at it not only you know just instead of just generally you know traffic. Low, which is historically what it's been, but look at it from the various perspectives of what is it from the pedestrian, what is it from the uh, vehicles, uh, what is it from the stakeholders that are involved with enforcement? Are we seeing an uptick in citations? All right. Um, here's one question for both of you How did you get the TNC data on dwell time and uptake? Um, so I can respond for the district. We haven't gotten TNC data for dwell time and uptake. However, we started conversations with TNCs in the past. Um, they um, sort of refused to give us data. 
Uh, but um, with the help of the bid, they're working with the bid, and we're hoping that they will provide um, data to the bid because the bid is a third party. And TNCs, um, usually, they're usually concerned about the information being foyable. So um, we're working with the bid and asking the bid to um, do some coordination with TNC as far as data sharing. Yeah, and, and from the bid's perspective, we're we're hopeful to be a, an intermediary between DDOT and the, the TNCs. You know, we're able to, we're not subject to FOIA in, in the district and, and, you know, we're, we're willing to sign NDAs and whatever needs to be done to, to, to help tell the story as best we can for the, for the pilot. Hi, this is Danielle. Um, so for our dwell times, uh, remember we said pickup is about one to five minutes, and then we said drop off is about 30 seconds or less, depending on your load in terms of people and luggage. Um, so we got our dwell time by standing on the curb. Um, so some of our staff went out to some really popular TNC uh, generators and basically stood on the curb and watched how pickup and drop off went. Uh, we also work with our partners at SFO, our airport here, um, and they've been collecting data as well. Um, they have a, you know, we have four large terminals, um, one, two, and three, as well as our international terminal, and they've been collecting a lot of data on TNC activity there and have really um, figured it out. So we've definitely been following their activities as well. Thanks. Um, Another question for both of you. Have you considered um, an access fee or monetizing the curb? <laughs> for, um, prioritizing for multi-passenger uh, pickups and drop-offs. Um, very good question, Chicago's... thank you. Oh, sorry. Very good when, question, well, thank you. That's fine, go ahead. Um, yes, we are looking into it, trying to figure out um, the metrics and how we go about it and some of the legal um, you know, implications of it, whether we can do it or not, but that's, um, that's a project that we have our own to-do list. We started discussing it um, actually a couple of weeks ago, so. So, and I think, Craig, you were just about to hint to it before we jumped in. Sorry, we were just too giddy excited because we were talking about it when Danielle was talking about dwell times and we're like, oh, I think our, our assumptions and our de deliberations on the use fee was on point. Um, but yes, uh, we understand the city of Chicago implemented a curbside uh, like use or access fee. Uh, so uh, based on hearing that, again, uh, plug for NACTO Designing Cities, uh, you hear a lot of great ideas. Uh, so we're like, hey, how can we do that here uh, from the perspective of uh, initially, you know, for TNC, you know, curbside management, but eventually for the future, you know, if it works with the TNCs, eventually you set up the framework with this curbside uh, access or even a mobility UC to deal with the autonomous vehicle environment. So that's something we're deliberate, deliberating here and hopefully within the next three to five years we may have some action and Chicago won't be the only one. Um, and this is Dart and Ito. I'm the, uh, the, the, I lead the Office of Innovation here at SFMTA. And uh, at this point in the conversation, um, we, we haven't talked specifically about pricing as part, part of the pilot, but um, you know, knowing that there's a, a good likelihood that uh, demand for passenger loading space uh, may not be able to be satisfied with the supply that we're able to provide, that um, pricing is something that we have uh, you know, kind of in our back pocket of thinking, um, you know, is, is that going to be an effective way to help to um, you know better meet uh, the supply and demand, uh, make that match while still achieving our goals of improving the, the safety of the passenger loading activity. All right, here's a question for DC. Um, you mentioned that geofencing didn't work. What was wrong with geofencing? Uh, so. Um, our first uh, foray into geofencing was the uh, 2017 presidential inauguration. I will reserve any comments on that part. But um, so we had set up a in coordination with our joint task force, which you know the secret U.S. Secret Service is the lead. They designate a part of the district uh, is off limits to uh, vehicular traffic, which encompassed a huge swath of the district. 
going uh, from basically north of the White House a couple blocks, you know, basically starting the National Mire a couple blocks in all directions, uh, which is, you know, also our downtown, so a lot of major destination points. So um, we had advised the TNC operators, you can't operate here at all, but we understood um, on operation day, uh, the Secret Service kept adjusting boundaries, uh, you know, physical barriers. So the uh, TNC operators were ignoring the geofencing. Uh, and we had set up pickup drop off locations. We set one up at the Kennedy Center, set one up here near our headquarters near National Park, one at RFK Stadium, and another one near Union Station. And I think out of, you know, we were out there for like 16 hours. Maybe the drop off points maybe was used like three times. Uh, so we felt that that wasn't happening. Past the inauguration, we had set it up for this most recent baseball season um, that we set up a specific, specific drop-off point near Nats Park, and then we didn't want any pickup and drop-off, but yet the uh, operators were ignoring it again and were dropping people off here on uh, M Street Southeast and South Capitol, which are the major arteries near the baseball stadium. We, you know, brought the operators in. It's like, why are you basically defying us here? And they're like, well, what we as a district are proposing to them is actually, from their perspective, going to in, um, increase congestion. So we're seeing it from one perspective. They're seeing an increased congestion of passenger flow and their own vehicles. And they felt that uh, they asked us, what is it that you're trying to accomplish at the end? And for us, it's we wanted safe uh, and efficient traffic flow in South Capitol and M. So can you figure out how to get your passengers away from those streets? And we will reconsider the geofencing. So we said, okay. Uh, so we dropped the geofencing and just told them just don't have any operators on South Cap and M. And they have complied and they will, um, and actually Uber partnered with uh, uh, the Nationals and uh, actually start organizing uh, as people are exiting baseball games, you know, if you're on the south side of the stadium, it's going to direct you to certain streets uh, in that direction away from the stadium without touching South Cap or M. Depending on which gate you're coming out of, they will direct you away from the stadium to a um, dispersed location so that there's no um, localized uh, congestion point. I mean, it's going to be heavy congestion around the stadium anyway, but uh, no part of the network is unduly overburdened. And, and I can talk a little bit. This is Pat from the Golden Triangle. In our in this particular pilot, we had conversations with the Metropolitan Police Department. There's a a group of officers that have jurisdiction kind of in that little couple block area that is called the Club Action Team. I referred to them earlier. Um, the one thing that they wanted to ensure is that these the the uh, customers that were 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 taking TNCs and getting rides and stuff like that. They wanted to, at, at best, not push them outside of their area of direct observation. You know, a lot of the folks here have been drinking. You know, they didn't want to pr provide victims or, or distribute the, the, the people amongst the, the rest of the neighborhood. They felt that it was better to have it uh, remain kind of uh, uh, consolidated to this three-block area. All right, we're just about out of time. We'll do one more question, uh, but I want to remind everyone while we're at the um, top of the hour, that um, the recording of the webinar and the slides will be on our website in the next couple of days. And any questions we haven't gotten through, we'll send around to the panelists uh, to answer and put that up online as well. Uh, so for the last question, uh, we wanted to ask about enforcement and how you enforce these regulations on your curbsides. So um, in, this, in this case, in this specific case for our pilot, um, our traffic enforcement officers, um, traffic control officers, rather, enforce the area um, as, uh, as well as um, Metropolitan Police Department. Um, we had conversations with our police department, department of, department of Public Works, DPW, that um, usually enforces parking. However, um, in this specific case, it didn't work out. We had to have an MOU with them because their staff don't work after 10 p.m. So uh, we had to have an MOU and um, sort of find out some sort of money for them to be able to um, pay their staff. So um, in this specific case, we weren't able to use our enforcement officers. We're using DDoS uh, traffic control officers or TCOs. And um, 
MPD officers. However, uh, we started working with uh, the Department of Public Works on p potential um, efforts for the next time around um, for this um, for the um, curb, curb mobility 2.0 program, so that um, we can perhaps have an MOU with them, sign an MOU, and figure out how we can use their assistance in enforcing these restrictions in the future. So to generally uh, to bring in the context of like any other city that's listening in, it's, it's a matter of reallocating your city resources that are dedicated to enforcement. In our case, our enforcement is 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Saturday. And of course, nightlife does not end at 10 o'clock. So that's us, uh, you know, wanting to get this executed. Uh, and of course, the process to reallocate resources to uh, mitigate, you know, to provide coverage, you know, that would take longer. So DDOT's uh, traffic control officers that they alluded to do also have ticket writing authority. So we leverage that ability because we can just make you know, the adjustments here. Uh, so that's just a conversation piece within your own respective cities, like uh, what resources do you have and how can you uh, nimbly uh, reallocate it to meet your needs. But in respect, I guess one last thing is the signage. Again, we try to keep the signs simple. Uh, and this comes to, you know, the no parking, stopping, or standing. Uh, and for our case, we just put signs that say no parking for the nighttime. Um, so basically, you can stop or stand, basically make your quick pit stop, do what you need to do, and move on. It's not exclusive to TNCs or taxis. So if you're a soccer mom with the van and want to drop your kids off to the nightclub, I don't I'm, there may be mothers out there that are being responsible, making or you know. Anyway, point of the matter is, anyone can pick up or drop off from that point, as long as you do your business and move along. Um, just one of the quick, um, one of the other things that we wanted to mention, and I think it would be, just we forgot to mention, is that um, um, when we look after we launched the program, one of the issues that we have now and discussing, um, perhaps is the possibility of having. Um, parking ambassadors and someone to help um, our police department, sort of like being at the curb and directing the traffic um, if TCOs are, or MPD officers are busy, uh, maybe we could um, have a group together, uh, perhaps with the help of a bid, to sort of um, have a parking ambassador group. Because um, one thing we realize is that even though the signs are there, people are not paying much attention to the signs. So as as soon as the first car parks there, the rest of the vehicles, the rest of the, the, rest of the cars follow, and they see an empty space, um, and they just pull in. So um, that's one of the things that we need to work on in the future. Any uh, input from SF? If not, we can wrap it up then. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Check out our website for the recording and more. And we hope to see you at our uh, next webinar.